are unable to attend today's class. Well, again, for all of you here, welcome, good evening. I'm going to begin today discussing the income statement. And we spent last week and two weeks ago talking about the balance sheet. So we're going to begin a discussion this week of the income statement, and we're going to conclude that discussion next Thursday. But before we get into the income statement, I want to just go through what is labeled a typical business operating cycle and talk about one of the assumptions that we employ in our communication time period. When it comes to the business cycle or the operating cycle, we have to first of all understand the business. Taking a step back to what we did in chapter two, we talked about two distinct activities, financing and investing activities, and how those activities affected the balance sheet. Well, tonight we're going to begin discussing how operating activities affect the income statement. Of course, as our roles as communicators, we're gonna to need to know how these activities that exist within the, op within the operating cycle are recognized and measured, and then how in turn we report those activities on the income statement that represent a vehicle of communication to help our audience, investors and creditors, have insight about the profitability of a company. And you see on this slide, the operating cycle. Now folks, one thing that I would like you to keep in mind is this illustration only focuses on operating activities. Because as you can see, the beginning of the cycle is the purchase of goods and services on credit. When we would look at a retail company, for example, Walmart. Walmart would purchase merchandise from manufacturers. Most uh, prime example would be Procter & Gamble. When Walmart would purchase merchandise from Procter & Gamble, it would be purchased on credit, whereas the credit terms can vary, but the most common credit term is net 30 or N30, which simply means that the buyer, in this case, Walmart, would have 30 days to pay for the merchandise that it bought. We are operating under the notion that the company has already acquired financing to conduct its operating activities. And also, we're operating under the notion that the company has, in fact, applied what it received through the financing activity process, i.e. raising money to acquire fixed assets. So once a company like Walmart purchases merchandise on credit, in time, it will have to pay the supplier. So depending on the credit terms, Walmart would pay Procter & Gamble. Once Walmart has its merchandise stock in its stores, it's available for sale. And the, the merchandise or the goods would be sold to customers. As the, as the sales are made to customers, customers would pay in cash, and then in turn, Walmart would receive cash. And then the process starts again, because as merchandise is being sold, shelves would have to be replenished, and in order to make that replenishment, Walmart once again would have to contact its manufacturers, again, using Procter & Gamble as an example, to buy merchandise in order to have the merchandise available for sale, okay? So in this particular slide, 
what we are focusing on is the relationships that a company would have with its suppliers and its customers. We're not talking about the relationship that a company would have with investors and creditors as it relates to raising money. We're dealing with the purchase and sale of merchandise or as well as services too. We can keep that in mind, but I want to keep it more clear where we're focusing on the relationship that a retail company would have with its suppliers and what the retail company has in terms of a relationship with its customers. Now, when it comes to our communication of these activities, the purchase of merchandise, the payment of cash, the sale of merchandise, and the receipt of cash, we are doing so under an assumption. And that assumption is we can identify, record, and communicate these activities within a specified period of time, a month, a quarter, and a year. The time period assumption simply means is we can recognize and measure transactions within a specific period of time. For example, Walmart selling merchandise in one of its stores, we will be able to record that sale today, September 22nd, so then we would be able to communicate that sale for the month of September, for the third quarter of 2021, and fiscal year 2021. But what we're going to set the stage for, for later discussion, is the fact that when transactions arise, we run into two questions when it comes to reporting these transactions in the appropriate time period. When should we recognize these transactions and what amount should be recognized? So there are going to be some things that you're going to see a little bit later that's going to make our work as communicators rather interesting, okay? So what I just wanted to do in the first learning objective is set the stage for what we're going to be talking about this evening. The next thing that I want to get into is how business activities, specifically operating activities, affect the elements of, of the income statement. And before we get into the income statement, I want to review the four prime elements of the income statement. And as I did with assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity, I like to use synonyms for the elements that exist within financial statements. The first element of the income statement is revenues. My synonym for that is rewards. When Walmart sells merchandise, it earns a reward in the form of revenue, which will have a positive effect on income. And it's also a positive effect in that the reward goes to not only Walmart, but also its stockholders. Because one thing, folks, that we want to remember when we communicate to investors, one of the reasons investors put money into a company is because they want their ownership stake to ap appreciate, to rise in value. And a major mechanism for causing the value of an investment or the price of a stock to appreciate or increase is through the rewards companies earn by selling products or services that we record as revenues. The second element is expenses. 
And my synonym for expenses is effort. And what we're going to see shortly is how our communication organizes effort in a manner in which we can provide investors and creditors with insights into how companies create, distribute, promote, and support what companies sell, okay? And one of the reasons I like using this effort reward connection is that's pretty much what a journal entry does. A journal entry describes the effort that a company gives and the reward it receives. So once again, when it comes to the, the elements of the income statement, I use the synonym rewards to describe revenues and expenses to describe effort. The last two elements, gains and losses, you're going to see in each element, gains and losses, the key word of peripheral. And that's the synonym that I use for labeling or describing gains and losses, peripheral. They are events that happen outside a company's core operation or outside its normal business activities. If any of you decide to choose Apple as the company for which you're going to do your project, as so I talked about last week with Apple regarding the amount of cash it generates from its operating activities, Apple will put excess cash into the purchase of securities in order to earn, in order for the cash to earn income. Apple will not sit on those securities for an extended period of time. At some point, Apple will sell the securities. The sale of the securities will create either a gain or a loss. The gain or loss on the sale of securities that a company like Apple would purchase, bonds or stock, represent events outside the company's core operations. Because remember, Apple sells computer products or sells technological products, however you want to label it. They're not in the business of buying and selling securities. Therefore, any gains or losses regarding the gain or sale, uh, any gains or losses from the sale of securities within a company like Apple, they would be considered peripheral. And what I'd like to do is go back to the story I talked about last week when I was sharing with you my experience with the Woolworth Corporation during the 1990s, when the company's operated, operations were not sufficient enough to generate enough cash receipts. And the company had only one prime element left to get necessary cash receipts or cash inflows, which was its real estate on stores that were owned by F.W. Woolworth Company and the Kinishu Corporation. The sale of those properties would have resulted on gains. Those gains would represent peripheral transactions or events outside the core operations, because remember, Woolworth, which is now Foot Locker, is not in the business of selling real estate. It's in the business of selling merchandise, okay? Before I begin, or before I continue, pardon me, does anyone have any questions about any of these elements that appear on this slide? I have a question. Can you... In expenses, you, you said create, distribute, what, what else was in there? Promote and support. And when we get to the income statement, Carleen, for Chipotle, because once again, we're going to have Chipotle as our sample company, you're going to, I will connect the elements 
are the sections of the income statement, specifically within the expense side, on the four tasks of creating, distributing, promoting, and supporting what companies sell. Okay, thank you. Does anyone, anyone else have any questions? Thank you, Carlene. Okay. Now you see we have an income statement for Chipotle. And as you can see, this financial statement is labeled. And the label, as you can see, has the company name, Chipotle Mexican Grill Incorporated. And you see that we are presenting a consolidated statement of income. And going back to what we talked about in chapter two regarding the balance sheet for Chipotle, a consolidated balance sheet simply means all of the operating divisions within Chipotle Mexican Grill would be included in this financial statement. Going back to my days with Woolworth, that company presented consolidated financial statements. The consolidated financial statements would contain all of the activities for the companies un under, at that time, the Woolworth Corporation umbrella. Uh, the most prominent, the FW Woolworth Company, the Kinney Shoe Corporation, and Woolworth Canada, okay? Now, once again, the income statement communicates over a period of time, okay? So we are telling our audience that this income statement contains transactions or events that took place during calendar year 2017. And I know that because it's saying for the year ended, December 31st, 2017. What that tells me is this income statement is going to contain transactions that occurred from January 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2017. And then as you can see, we're going to report the data in millions of dollars except per share data. I'm going to get into the per share data as I go through this process of presentation, okay? Now, once again, the beauty of our process as communicators is organized. We begin with the communication of revenue. Now, I'm just going to take a step back, and as you can see, on the left-hand side of the income statement, the income statement is divided into two components, operating activities and peripheral activities. As you can see, the operating activities focus on the center or the core of the business, whereas the peripheral activities focus on events that happen outside the core business. So we begin with reporting restaurant sales revenue. Now, when companies use the term sales revenue, it is a signal to indicate that the sales are coming from the sale of products, okay? So something to keep in mind, when you see an income statement that uses the revenue term sales revenue, it is going to be the sale of product. As you can see, Chipotle is more descriptive on the term sales revenue by including the word restaurant. So restaurant sales revenue focuses specifically on what is being sold in the Chipotle restaurants, okay? Now, after the operating revenue is reported. We now get into the operating expenses. And the first category of operating expenses is the expenses that happen within the restaurant, okay? Now, if you choose 
companies for your project, like Apple, CVS, the Ford Motor Company, those companies would have an expense appearing immediately after operating revenues called cost of goods sold. The restaurant operating expenses that you see for Chipotle Grill is a synonym or a comparison to cost of goods sold, okay? What the restaurant operating expenses include are the expenses to create and distribute what Chipotle sells. So all of the elements that are necessary to cook food, deliver the food, whether it be to customers in restaurants or to provide through takeout or delivery, those, ex those activities would be in recorded as expenses within the restaurant operating section, okay? Now, Ryan, getting back to your question last week about inventory for Chipotle, why it didn't appear on the balance sheet, well, it gets back to this constraint that we operate within called the cost constraint. The cost of managing the inventory of the ingredients and the like within Chipotle restaurants would far exceed, exceed, pardon me, the communication of these items on the Chipotle balance sheet. So as Chipotle acquires ingredients and other elements necessary for the preparation and the creation of food, we would record that in the supplies expense. So Ryan, getting back to what you were asking last week, the supplies expense basically represents the alternative to managing these items on the balance sheet as inventory, okay? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Great, great. Okay, so the next item that you see is wages expense. Now you notice on the right hand side, it includes salaries expense. Salaries and wages represent compensation. And in this case, the salaries and wages are gonna focus on the compensation of the people who are working within the restaurant, the operation of the restaurant, okay? And remember, there is a difference between a salary and a wage. A salary is expressed in an annual amount, whereas a wage is expressed in an hourly rate. Then we have the other expenses. Rent would typically be the rent for the restaurants that are in malls or strip centers. Insurance would be insurance on the equipment in the restaurants, the insurance on perhaps the, the space itself. Utilities would be the electricity, the gas, the sewer, the heat, the sewer, and water. Repairs would be repairs within the restaurant itself or the equipment within the restaurant. And then the other operating expenses, the reporting the individual amounts within this category, Chipotle's management deems as immaterial. Therefore, they just have one line in this section called other operating expenses and if the reader of the income statement would like to know more about the details, those details should appear within the notes of the financial statement, okay? So once again, the restaurant operating expenses would focus on the task of creating and distributing what Chipotle is selling, okay? Does anyone have any questions on this element of the income statement. Okay, the next element is labeled general and administrative expenses. It can also be called administrative expenses. You, are, you will find in many companies' income statements, especially companies that either buy merchandise for resale 
or manufacture products, after the cost of goods sold, the next expense would be something called selling general and administrative expense or SG&A. And as you can see, within the general and administrative expenses, we have two elements, training and advertising. The training would represent an ex would represent effort to support what the company sells. The training is necessary to make sure that the people who are working at the restaurants are conducting themselves in a manner that supports the value proposition that Chipotle Mexican Grill wants to project with its customers, okay? And when we make the connection from this line, training expense, to what you'll learn in microeconomics, we're focusing on the connection of training expense to something called a differentiator. What makes a company stand out from its competition in terms of characteristics of what the company sells? The examples that I use, accessibility, competence, courtesy, durability, and innovation, okay? The next line, as you can see, is advertising. The advertising focuses on how Chipotle promotes what it sells, okay? So within the general and administrative expense section of the Chipotle income statement, the two lines that you see, training and advertising or advertising and training focus on the activities that are going on in the company to promote and support what the company sells, okay? Does anyone have any questions on the general and administrative expenses? Okay, the next line that you see is depreciation expense. And I just wanna talk a little bit about a statistic called earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, or EBITDA, okay? Many companies, in order to simplify the calculation of EBITDA, will have depreciation expense as a separate line item, okay? When it comes to our communication, investors, most notably private equity firms, like to use the statistic EBITDA because it represents a basis for doing a valuation of a company, okay? When I was doing work with Martin, one of the questions that Martin wanted to have answered was what is the company's valuation? What's its price tag? And that answer was determined by the presentation of a statistic called EBITDA. So in case you're wondering, why the depreciation expense is listed as a separate line, it is to simplify the presentation of EBITDA, a very important statistic used by investors, okay? Then you can see the loss on disposal of assets. That would apply to the equipment that would be in a Chipotle, in a Chipotle restaurant, okay? Typically, when a fixed asset has used up its useful life, the asset is disposed, and what typically happens is a loss is recorded. So that's what this loss on disposal is. Then we have the total operating expenses, and the total operating expenses would comprise the restaurant operating expenses, general administrative expenses, depreciation, loss on disposal of assets, okay? And then we would have income from operations. And the income from operations would represent the difference between the restaurant sales revenue and the total operating expenses, okay? Before I continue, does anyone have any questions at this point? 
Okay, the other items, as you can see, interest revenue. The interest revenue could be on perhaps a notes receivable, which would represent a loan that would be made by Chipotle. It could also be interest on bonds that the company has purchased as investments, okay? The interest expense, when it comes to borrowing money, there are three distinct transactions. The borrowing, the repayment, and the cost of borrowing. Interest, simply stated, is the cost of money. So the interest expense represents the cost of monies borrowed by Chipotle. So then we take those two items and include them with income from operations to have a statistic called income before income taxes. On, your, on our tax returns, that would be the equivalent of taxable income, okay? Then we have the last expense, income tax expense. Now, folks, keep in mind, and I want to be careful because I don't want to turn this into an intermediate accounting class lecture, but income tax expense is an expense based on how generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP recognizes income before income, before income taxes. It is not, is not, is not the tax payment to the Internal Revenue Services, okay? I just want to mention that, but this is a topic that we get into much greater detail when intermediate accounting covers in a chapter accounting for income taxes. So I just want to mention that this income tax expense does not represent the amount due to the Internal Revenue Service. It is a calculation based on income and revenues and expenses that are recorded under the guise of generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. We then take the income before income taxes, subtract the income tax expense. We have the statistic in the income statement, net income, okay? And as you can see, as expressed in million of dollars, during 2017, Chipotle Mexican Grill Incorporated earned income in the amount of $176 million, okay? Before I go to the earnings per share, does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, earnings per share. As you can see on the right-hand side of the income statement, you see we are taking the $176 million in net income and dividing that by $28.4 million. That $28.4 million represents a weighted average number of common stock shares outstanding, okay? We will expand on this when we get into earnings per share or EPS in and great at, 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 at a later date. What the $6.19 represents is one share of Chipotle Mexican Grill stock is receiving a reward of $6.19 of income earned by the company, okay? As I said earlier, we're going to get into earnings per share in greater detail when we discuss this statistic. But the thing that I just want you to keep in mind when it comes to earnings per share or its acronym, EPS. EPS is a very prominent statistic in business periodicals like Investor's Business Daily and the Wall Street Journal. 
as well as business networks like Bloomberg, CNBC, and Fox Business. This statistic is used by analysts to evaluate how strong or weak the company is from the profitability perspective and makes inferences based on the EPS number as to whether the company is looking good or bad or is presenting an upward or downward trend in its earnings, okay? So that's just something to keep in mind when you're reading periodicals like the Investor's Business Daily or the Wall Street Journal or watching business news on Bloomberg, CNBC, or Fox Business. This statistic will come up every three months. And when you, when you read these periodicals or watch any one of those three networks next month, October, this statistic will be mentioned quite often because many companies will be, will be closing its quarter at the end of September, one week from today. And this statistic will be presented to people outside the company. So just keep in mind that earnings per share or EPS resonates with people outside the company, okay? Before I get into the next slide and continue my presentation. Another way of looking at the income statement for Chipotle is it's describing how it is delivering its products or providing a service of mostly delivering its products in the form of the food that it serves in its restaurants. And that delivery can be described through the various operating expenses that exist within the, the conducting of the affairs inside the restaurant, the training and advertising that is being done by the corporate office, the depreciation, which I'm gonna get into depreciation regarding its definition a little bit later, the loss on the disposal of assets, as well as the revenue earned on, from interest related to any notes receivable or any investments in bonds and any interest and the interest expense, the cost of money. But from a big picture perspective, this statement is telling the story of how Chipotle Mexican Grill is providing its customers with meals in its restaurants, okay? Before I continue my presentation, does anyone have any questions about what appears on this slide as it relates to Chipotle's income statement? Okay. Now, when it comes to operating revenues, what I want you to focus on is this section right here the operations of the business, the sale of products or the rendering of services, the central focus or the core of the business. So for example, when Chipotle sells burritos, it has earned revenue. We can extend that to other companies. When Apple sells iPhones, it has earned revenue. When Procter & Gamble, sells Tide laundry detergent, it has earned revenue. When Kraft Heinz sells Oreo cookies, it has earned revenue. All of the descriptions that I presented in addition to what you see regarding Chipotle represents operating revenue for these companies because those sales represent the central focus or the core of these businesses, whether the business is Apple, whether it's Procter & Gamble, or it's Kraft Heinz, okay? Now, when it comes to operating expenses, what I wanna focus on is the second bullet point. Expenses are not expenditures, okay? Expenditures, is as you can see, an outflow of cash 
or we can label it a cash disbursement or a cash payment, okay? We're going to get into this a little bit later in tonight's class, but expenditures and expenses are not necessarily the same. As you can see on the third bullet point, not all cash expenditures are expenses. And as you can see, going back to the second bullet point, when a company like Chipotle buys equipment for its restaurants, the equipment would be recorded as a fixed asset. Therefore, the purchase of equipment would not be an expense. Paying off a bank loan would represent the settlement of an obligation. The settlement obligation, which would be a decrease in a liability, is not an expense. So just keep in mind that when we are talking about expenditures, we are not necessarily talking about expenses. And you'll see a little bit later why we want to be clear when we use the term expenses. Now, as you can see with the examples of Chipotle's operating expenses, the first one that I want to get into is the depreciation. Now, in economics, depreciation is defined as the wear and tear of a resource or an asset, okay? For our purposes, depreciation does not represent wear and tear. It, our definition of depreciation is different from what the economist would use as a, de, a definition of depreciation. Our definition of depreciation is a systematic allocation of cost, okay? When we get into depreciation later in the semester, when we talk about fixed assets, you're going to see that depreciation is nothing more than a cost allocation methodology. It does not represent the decline in, an, in a fixed assets value due to wear and tear. So I want to make this point at the outset. The supplies expense as we saw earlier in the Chipotle income statement, the supplies would simply represent the inventory of ingredients and the like that would go into the preparation and delivery of food that Chipotle would offer at its restaurants. Wages expense, as I mentioned earlier, many companies would use the term salaries and wages expense to indicate the distinctions between the forms of compensation. A salary is expressed as an annual amount. The wage is expressed as an hourly rate. The rent expense, again, the rent expense would typically be on the rent that Chipotle would pay to landlords that would own properties that would comprise malls or strip centers. The insurance expense it would be on the elements inside the restaurant, okay? Protection against damage. The utilities, the electricity, the gas, the water and sewer that would be incurred by the restaurants, and then the repairs expense, any type of repairs that would have to be done to any equipment or any furniture and fixtures in the restaurants, okay? Now, the other income statement items, interest or dividend revenue. The interest revenue would take place when a company loans money, and the loan could be in the form of a notes receivable, or it could be in the form of a short or long-term investment where the investment is in a bond or bonds, okay? Dividend revenue would represent revenue from the investments that a company would make in stock of other companies in which the stock of other companies would be paying a dividend. Interest expenses. 
once again, is the cost of money. That is the simple definition of interest. Remember, with borrowing money, we record the borrowing of the money, the repayment of the, of the loan, and the cost of borrowing, the interest expense. That appears on the income statement. And folks, keep in mind that when we connect the other income statement items, the interest expense is not the same as a dividend. And that's going to come into play as you get into finance when we connect interest in dividends to something called the cost of capital, which simply stated is the cost of financing. Then you see the gains or losses on sales of investments. As I mentioned earlier, with a company like Apple that is generating so much cash from its operating activities, it wants its cash to earn income. So the excess cash is put into the purchase of securities like bonds or stocks. At some point, Apple will sell those investments and those sales would generate a gain or loss. Then of course, the income tax expense would be an expense based on the income that is calculated using generally accepted accounting principles. Again, the income tax expense is not the monies owed to the Internal Revenue Service. The monies owed to the Internal Revenue Service uses a dictionary called the Internal Revenue Code. That is outside this course, okay? And then, of course, you see on the square, corporations are required, and this comes from GAAP as well as the Securities and Exchange Commission, to disclose earnings per share. On the income statement, it can be typically included in the income statement or in the notes to the financial statements. But typically, companies will report their earnings per share or that acronym EPS on the income statement. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about any of these elements that comprise other income statement items? Now, when it comes to this slide on data analytics, you see that in the first paragraph in bold type, business can collect and analyze incredible amounts and types of data to enhance revenues and reduce costs, okay? One thing that I hope you take from the classroom to the job as it relates to this course Accounting information provides a treasure trove of data, okay? This is something that individuals don't have to recreate the wheel. The transactions that companies have when it sells product, pays employees, pays suppliers, etc have a lot of data in them. And that data can be used to acquire a better understanding on how the company is connecting with its customers, its employees, and its suppliers. Okay, so just keep in mind, as I talked about last week, accounting software represents a treasure trove of data. So please keep that in mind as you're connecting what we're talking about this semester, this semester from the classroom to the job. Now, as you can see, point of sale terminals also labeled as POS terminals, formerly known as cash registers. When companies sell product, most notably restaurants like, like Chipotle or retailers like Walmart, now, these terminals will collect data. Let's take, when you take a look at a company like Walmart that has its products containing barcodes, 
those codes, when scanned, contain a whole host of data. And through the scanning action, that data that is being scanned from the barcode will go into the point of sale or POS terminal. And the POS terminals are connected to the accounting software in ways that will allow the accounting software to record the revenue that was earned and the cash that was collected, okay? Now, what I wanna talk about here is the three bullet points, what McDonald's is using to predict customer demand in the drive-through sales. Basically, in the, for McDonald's, what they're trying to figure out is what the customers want and when through the drive-through. So it can better organize itself in a way that can meet customer demand. Because remember, when it comes to the core of economics, supply and demand, if McDonald's is unable to supply what customers demand, the customers will go elsewhere. So McDonald's is using data to make sure it's supplying when customers are demanding. Wendy's, they're looking at data in ways to find locations that will be the most profitable, okay? Now, in this particular bullet point, we're making a connection to managerial accounting because I discussed this when teaching managerial accounting. It's also in financial management called capital budgeting. Capital budgeting basically is a process that provides the opportunity to determine whether a company should make an investment in a long-term asset, most notably fixed assets. The restaurant locations for Wendy's would represent a fixed asset, okay? Going back to my days at Woolworth, when I worked at a division called Anderson Little, one of the things that was done within Anderson Little was to prepare an analysis to determine whether the company was going to meet return on investment or ROI targets. Now, companies like Wendy's are employing big data to incorporate an ROI analysis in terms of where it would be best to maximize the return on investment based on where the, rest, where, uh, the appropriate location, okay? Pizza Hut. Now, I will tell you, I got a little bit mm, when I was reading the last line of what customers subconsciously want. It makes me a little bit nervous on something like that. People, people are probing my brain. But basically, what Pizza Hut is trying to do is figure out what people want. And that is something to make sure that Pizza Hut, when we look at the simplistic view of supply and demand, it's supplying what people are demanding, okay? And the reason I want to get into these three bullet points is I want to emphasize something, folks, as it relates to accounting. Accounting is the study of transactions, okay? When we as accountants study transactions, we are looking at them in ways that affect when we're gonna record those transactions in terms of timing, like I talked about earlier, regarding time periods, so that the time periods, whether it be a month, quarter, or year, are properly expressed. We're also studying the transactions to see whether we're dealing with assets, liabilities, contributed capital, revenues, or expenses, okay? And then, of course, in terms of our study, to properly communicate through the income statement, the statement of stockholders' equity, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows. Our study of, tr of transactions can connect the financial analysis, okay? What I would hope that you will keep in mind when it comes to these examples that you see for McDonald's, Wendy's and Pizza Hut, we can use these and other examples as ways to enhance 
our financial statement analysis based on what appears on the four financial statements. And that gets back to the big picture or the big theme that I emphasize when teaching financial accounting or managerial accounting. In this case, financial accounting, literacy, the ability to read and write. What I'd like you to take from this slide on how these data analytic examples can help us enhance or improve our financial literacy as it relates to reading the data that exists within financial statements, okay? Does anyone have any questions or comments about what appears in this slide? Now, we talk about accounting as the language of business. As you can see in this slide, there is a particular language that can be used, cash basis accounting, okay? And as you can see, for cash basis accounting, we record the revenues when cash is received, and we record expenses when cash is paid. So you see, if we're using cash basis accounting, the net income calculation is cash received minus cash paid, okay? Now, when it comes to cash basis accounting, small businesses would be the prime user of cash basis accounting, okay? The thing that I want you to take from this course to the job is this square right here. And I'm just gonna read it out and notice the inflection of my voice. Cash basis accounting may lead to an incorrect interpretation of future company performance. As a result, GAAP, or generally accepted accounting principles, does not allow the cash basis of accounting, okay? I'm gonna talk about the alternative a little bit later. Why is there an issue with cash basis accounting? Well, when we take a look at these cash basis income statements, for years one through three, as you can see in year one, the net operating cash flows is negative. It could be, it could be perceived, interpreted, construed as being a problem regarding cash flows that could be generated in the future, okay? So what we are doing is if we use cash basis accounting, we can be giving a false impression of what's going on. What I like to use as an example is when you may watch a Boston news station and you get to the weather and the weather is talking about thunderstorms or a snowstorm that's gonna take place. And then when the forecast is expanded, you realize that this activity is happening in New Hampshire or Vermont. It's not affecting us here in Southern New England. So that's providing a false impression of the weather. Cash basis accounting in comparison can do something similar. It can give a false impression of the company's financial health as it relates to the elements of profitability, the ability to earn income, Liquidity, the ability of the company to pay bills, and solvency, the ability of the company to exist over the long term, okay? We have a language to use in our communication, and that's what I'm going to get into next, accrual basis accounting, okay? But before I get into this, does anyone have any questions on what I've discussed so far? Okay. 
What is accrual basis accounting? Well, first of all, folks, the thing we understand or realize is when companies have revenues and expenses, they can happen before cash is received or paid or after cash is received or paid, okay? A revenue or an expense can be recognized before or after cash is paid or received, okay? So we, as communicators, recognize revenues when they are earned and expenses when they are incurred. In other words, we recognize the revenues and expenses when they take place. This statement, revenues are recognized when they are earned and expenses when they are incurred, is the definition of accrual basis accounting, okay? And as you can see, accrual basis accounting is required by GAAP, generally ex accepted accounting principles, okay? Now, when it comes to our application of GAAP, we are guided by something called the revenue recognition principle. And as you can see in this illustration, revenue must be recognized when the company transfers the promised goods or services to its customers and in the amount it expects to be entitled or received, okay? What I like for our company study, Chipotle, is you can see in this illustration, cash may be, be received before the food is delivered, when the food is delivered, or after the food is delivered. For our purposes of using accrual basis accounting, we record or recognize the revenue when the food is delivered, okay? So let's take this and look at examples. Let's suppose Chipotle receives cash before it delivers food, okay? Now, let's take a look at the description of the transaction. The company receives a $100 cash deposit. Now notice in this journal entry, you see next to cash in parentheses, plus A. Plus A means an increase in assets. And remember our rule when we record a journal entry. If you increase assets, you debit. Because we're increasing cash, our journal entry is recording a debit to cash, okay? You see right below for the account unearned revenue in parentheses plus L. The plus L means, an increase, means we are increasing liabilities. So our rule is if you increase liabilities, you credit. And we're crediting unearned revenue because when a company receives a cash de deposit to provide products or services, the company has an obligation to provide the product or services. Remember our synonym for an obligation, a liability. When this transaction is recorded, we record the cash received and the obligation to deliver the food, okay? Does anyone have any questions about the first transaction? Okay, now the food has been delivered. Once the food is delivered, we can recognize the revenue. But here's the thing. 
you see on the delivery of the ordered food, we are not debiting cash because we've already received the cash. We are debiting unearned revenue because we are settling the obligation. The obligation that is being settled is the delivery of food. And you see in the section where we're debiting unearned revenue, we have in parentheses minus L. Minus L means a decrease in liabilities. Our rule is if you decrease liabilities, you debit. And once again, we're debiting unearned revenue because we're settling the obligation of delivering food to a customer or customers, okay? So once the food is delivered, we record the revenue labeled restaurant sales revenue. And in parentheses, you see plus R. Plus R means an increase in revenue. We know revenue is an element of retained earnings. Retained earnings is an element of stockholders' equity. So when we increase revenue, we also increase retained earnings and we increase stockholders' equity. The key for our journal entry is the plus SE. That means an increase the stockholders' equity. So our rule is if we increase stockholders' equity, we record a credit. So the second journal entry records the recognition of revenue because of the delivery of food, which is the base, which is based on the obligation that existed when a cash deposit was made on the order. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on the first and or second journal entries? Okay. Now, let's suppose that the cash is paid when the food is delivered, okay? If cash is paid by the customer, when the customer receives the delivery of the ordered food, we have a very simple journal entry. We debit cash and we credit the restaurant sales revenue. As you can see on the cash debit, we see plus A. That means increase, an increase to assets. Our rule, if you increase assets, you debit. The restaurant sales revenue, as you can see, we have in parentheses, plus R. That means we are increasing revenue. But the key for us is plus SE the increase in stockholders' equity. Our rule, if you increase stockholders' equity, we credit, okay? Before I continue, does anyone have any questions about this journal entry? What I wanna do before I proceed is I wanna talk about the debit to cash. I wanna make a connection to what you will learn in macroeconomics regarding the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve is the, is the federal entity that manages our money supply, okay? Now, in order for the Federal Reserve to manage money, it defines money. And the first the definition of money is what's called M1. Within M1, the Federal Reserve considers credit cards as a form of cash. So if you are getting a delivery from Chipotle and you are paying the delivery for, with your credit card, Chipotle will record that credit card receipt as cash because the Federal Reserve has defined a credit card like a Visa or MasterCard as cash. So just keep in mind that the debit of cash is not necessarily dollar bills. 
It's also the credit card, specifically a bank credit card like Visa or MasterCard. I'd just like you to keep that in mind, okay? Now, when it comes to the delivery of products or services, a customer does not have to pay immediately. Let's go back to the work of my accounting firm. If I was providing services during the month of September, after I finish up my work next Thursday, September 30th, GAP allows me to record the revenue for the work that I did in September. However, I've not received cash. Because I've not re received cash, but have provided services, I, have re I can create something called an accounts receivable. An accounts receivable means monies owed from customers. Monies owed from customers, okay? So if you are working at a company and your company decides it wants to have lunch catered by Chipotle and you have an account, your company has an account with Chipotle and which Chipotle would send you an invoice or a bill for the food, in this case, the $50, that invoice or bill would represent an accounts receivable. So as you can see, we are going to increase accounts, we're going to increase assets by recording a debit to accounts receivable because the accounts receivable represents monies owed for the food that was ordered, okay? And as you can see, again, we are crediting the restaurant sales revenue because since the food was delivered, GAP allows us to recognize the revenue and because revenue increases stockholders' equity, that's what the plus SE means, that our rule is if you increase stockholders' equity, you credit. So our journal entry increases assets by recording a debit to accounts receivable and it increases stockholders' equity by recording a credit to restaurant sales revenue, okay? Once cash is received, we can then record the cash receipt by debiting cash, because again, the cash receipt increases assets, and our rule, if you increase assets, you debit, and we're crediting the accounts receivable. We're crediting the accounts receivable because the customer has owed, has paid what it owed, okay? The customer has paid what it owed. So when a customer pays what it owed, it reduces accounts receivable. The reduction of accounts receivable decreases assets. So our rule is if you decrease assets, you credit, okay? So the minus A that appears after accounts receivable represents a decrease in assets. Does anyone have a question about one or both of the transactions that appear in this slide? Now, as you can see, the FASB and the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, they have established what's known as a joint rec revenue recognition standard, okay? I'm going to get into this revenue recognition a little bit later. But what I'd like you to take away from this slide is these five steps represent a process. And always remember, folks, Accounting is guided by processes. Processes allow us to organize ourselves in manner in a manner that enhances our ability, ability to communicate. So I just want you to keep in mind, 
that these steps or this process of recognizing revenue is another example on how our act our actions to describe the delivery of products and services, what we're doing today, the income statement, what we did last week and two weeks ago, the telling the story of a company's acquisition of resources and how they were acquired, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flow, how companies receive and spend money. That communication is organized into processes. And I just I want you to take away from this slide that we have a process in place that helps us recognize revenue, okay? Now we get into what's known as the expense recognition principle, and it's also called matching, okay? I wanna talk about this from the perspective of the matching principle. Let's go back to Chipotle, okay? Chipotle will have its store, its restaurants located in malls or strip centers. Chipotle won't, will not own the space in the mall or the strip center, okay? Because it doesn't own the space, it must pay rent. The rent, when reported, must match the revenue, okay? That's the matching principle. We match the effort to the reward. The effort labeled rent represents the effort to use the space in order to earn revenue. So the matching principle simply stated connects effort to reward. And there are a whole host of other things that can come into play. But I wanna talk about this expense recognition from the perspective of the matching principle, okay? So as you can see in this illustration, we can pay cash before we use supplies for the repairs on the same day or the employees for their work in the prior period, okay? We record the expense when the effort is used, okay? We record the expense when the effort is used. So let's expand on this with this example. Now, when you look at your companies, your companies will buy office supplies. And when your company buys office supplies, the supplies are put in a cabinet or a closet for later use. When your company pays cash for office supplies, it is acquired an asset, a resource, okay? And that's what we're doing here when it comes to the first transaction. The payment of $200 of cash for supplies. The payment for supplies means the company has acquired an asset or a resource called supplies. Remember the plus A means an increase in assets. Our rule is if you increase assets, you debit. So that represents the debit to supplies. Well, the supplies came from the payment of cash. So we know our journal entry has to include cash. The payment of cash decreases assets, which you see in parentheses minus A. Our rule, if you decrease assets, you credit. So our journal entry for the payment of, of cash for supplies debit supplies and credits cash. We've acquired one asset supplies by using another asset to get them cash. Now, when the supplies are used, when the supplies are used, we have to recognize or record an expense because what was used 
is supplies, we have to record a supply expense, okay? In this situation, for the usage of supplies, we, want, we are increasing expenses. Now, remember, revenues increase stockholders' equity. Expenses do the opposite. Expenses decrease stockholders' equity. That is represented by the minus SE. Minus SE means we are reducing stockholders' equity. So our rule is if you decrease stockholders' equity, we debit. So we're recording a debit for the use of supplies, that is supplies expense. Well, the supplies came from what we had in our inventory of supplies, okay? So when we use the asset supplies, we are decreasing supplies or decreasing assets. The decrease in assets, you can see with the code minus A. Our rule is if you decrease assets, you credit. So that's why we are crediting the supplies account. So our journal entry, debit to supplies expense, credit supplies, represents the use of supplies that we had in our inventory, okay? Before I continue, does anyone have any questions about the first journal entry and or second journal entry? Okay. Now let's talk about Chipotle if equipment breaks down. They call someone to repair the equipment. That person comes today. The person does the work, gets paid in cash, okay? Because the work is done today, or we're using the expertise of a repairman, we have an expense called repairs expense. And as you can see, the repairs expense increases expenses. And remember what an expense does. It decreases stockholders' equity, okay? And remember our rule. If you decrease stockholders' equity, you debit. So our journal entry is going to represent a debit to repairs expense. By using the expertise of the repairman, we had to pay cash for that expertise. So by paying cash, we're decreasing cash. When we decrease cash, we decrease assets. The decrease in assets you see in parentheses minus A. Minus A means decrease assets. Our rule is if you decrease assets, you credit. That represents the credit to cash. So our journal entry, debit to cash, pardon me, debit to repairs expense, credit to cash means we paid for using a repair service, okay? Does anyone have any questions about this journal entry? Okay. Now, folks, something to keep in mind. As an, as an employee, you are in effect lending your employer something. You're lending them the time that you're working. That loan means your employer has an obligation to pay you for your services, okay? So let's take a look at this transaction. The employees have worked over a period of time. Let's suppose for argument's sake that the employees have worked from this past, that they worked last week, they worked from Monday, September 12th to 
Friday, September 16th, okay? The employees are not going to get paid on Friday, September 16th. They're going to be paid tomorrow, Friday, September 23rd. So on Friday, September 16th, the employer has an obligation to pay its employees for the work that it did last week. Well, the work that the employees did represents an expense. And the expense we capture as a wage expense. As shown earlier in the Chipotle income statement, the wages expense includes salaries. Now, the way I was brought up, we always record salaries and wages expense. So if I say salaries and wages expense or salaries expense, I mean wages expense. But just let's remember about an expense. An expense reduces stockholders' equity. Our rule is if you decrease stockholders' equity, you debit. So we're debiting the wage expense, okay? Now, at this point, the company has not paid its employees for their work. The company has an obligation to pay its employees. The synonym for the obligation is liability. So when the company owes its employees money, the company has increased its liabilities. So the rule is if you increase liabilities, as you can see, the plus L, we record a credit. And we're recording a credit called wages payable. That can also be expressed as a salary in wages payable or a salaries payable, okay? So our first journal entry simply means the company owes the employees for their work. Okay, does anyone have any questions about that journal entry? Okay, for example's sake, this journal entry is recorded on Friday, September 16th. Friday, September 23rd, tomorrow, the employees get paid for the work they did last week. Tomorrow, September 23rd, the company will have settled its obligation with its employees by paying them. The company would have settled the obligation with its employees by paying them. The settlement of the obligation results in a decrease in liabilities. The rule, if you decrease liabilities, you debit. Therefore, we are debiting the liability account, which is payable. Because the obligation was settled, and it was settled in the form of a cash payment, we are decreasing cash. Decreasing cash means decreasing assets, okay? And the rule is if you decrease assets, you credit. So this journal entry, the debit to wages payable and the credit to cash, means the employees were paid what they were owed, okay? The employees were paid what they were owed. Does anyone have any questions about the second journal entry? Okay. Now, as you can see, we have these management incentives to violate accounting rules. What I wanna talk about in this slide is WorldCom, okay? A book that I read over the summer, Extraordinary Circumstances, written by Cynthia Cooper. Cynthia Cooper was one of the individuals, perhaps the key person who uncovered the fraud that you see on this slide, okay? 
the recording of $11 billion in operating expenses as if they were assets, okay? Now, in the book that Cynthia Cooper wrote, one of the things that was used as a defense by Scott Sullivan. Scott Sullivan was the chief financial officer who was considered the architect of this fraud. He actually used the matching principle as his argument for recording these expenses as assets. His argument was these expenses, which were actually line costs. The line costs allowed WorldCom access to networks that it could be using for its cell phone services. Scott Sullivan's argument was since these line costs were not generating revenue, there was no expense to match to the revenue. Therefore, he had used that argument of matching to justify the recording of these expenses as assets. However, that was very specific in its rule for the recording of the line cost. The line costs were, record, were to be recorded as expenses. That is gap. Okay, so this particular principle that we discussed earlier, the matching principle, it actually was used as a way to justify this fraud at WorldCon. Okay, and if any of you would like to learn more about WorldCon, because WorldCon actually had replaced Enron as the largest corporate bankruptcy in US history. Now Lehman Brothers holds that honor. Cynthia Cooper's book, Extraordinary Circumstances, is an excellent book to read. It's a very interesting story. And those of you who would like to learn more about an, an internal audit function, Cynthia Cooper does a very nice job describing the internal audit function as it existed in WorldCom, okay? So I wanted to mention that. Now, you don't see in this illustration Enron. Enron might require its own slide deck. But what I'd like to talk about with Enron when it came to the violation of accounting rules was something called special purpose entities or SPEs. SPEs was a vehicle that allowed Enron to remove debt off its books, okay? And there was a 3% rule that could be incorporated so that if an outside investor was providing up to 3% of the funding, for this special purpose entity or the SBE, work companies could remove the debt from the books. So Enron used this 3% rule to hide debt, okay? That's one example of an incentive to violate accounting rules. Removing debt in a ways that makes the company look more liquid, and more solvent. Now, the meat and potatoes, the meat on the bone, so to speak, that Enron used to violate accounting rules was something called mark to market accounting. Okay. Now, what I'm going to use as an example of mark to market is what's called fair value accounting. Let's take a company like. Amazon. Amazon has investments in many companies, okay? Now, these investments are made when, en when Amazon buys stock of the company, whether it's in the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Because 
there's a market value, a price for the securities, i.e. stock, generally accepted accounting principles allow us to change the carrying value or the carrying amount of the investment in stock, okay? Mark to market kind of sort of work similar, whereas a company can restate the carrying value of its assets using market values. Well, Mark, well, Enron used mark to market value to a whole new level. And one of my favorite books that talks about this type of stuff called The Smartest Guys in the Room, written by Bethany McLean and Peter Elkind. It is an excellent book that gets into what Enron did with Mark to Market. Enron, without question, used the accounting rules to violate the communication of assets, liabilities, equity, revenues, and expenses, okay? Now, the thing that I want to get into now when it comes to the accounting rules, as it relates to a question of ethics, one of the things we've talked about this semester is convergence. It is the marriage of GAAP and IFRS. As we've talked about this semester, GAAP is used here in the United States. IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, is used outside the United States. IFRS is considered a more principle-based standard where it allows for greater interpretation. GAAP is considered a rules-based language in that GAAP is very specific in terms of the accounting for transactions, okay? This is something to keep in mind. When GAAP pronounces these rules, it allows for opportunities to game the system, okay? And I thought about this this morning. I wanted to use it in, today's, in tonight's presentation. Those of you, Gary, I'm sure you've heard of one William Stephen Belichick, okay? I should have worn the Bill Belichick t-shirt tonight to make, the, to make the point, but nonetheless. Well, Bill Belichick, when he was at Andover Academy, met an individual named Ernie Adams. Ernie Adams was basically a football savant. Ernie Adams coached at a number of teams with Bill Belichick, the New York Giants, the Cleveland Browns, where Belichick was the head coach, and here up in New England. Well, when all the stories were coming about regarding the videotaping and the footballs and stuff like that, both Bill Belichick and Ernie Adams were compared to tax accountants. And they were compared to tax accountants because they were basically looking at the rules that the National Football League put forth and stretching them in a way so that they would still be following the rules, but having room to operate, okay? Now, one may argue that inter international financial standards being more principle-based can lead to more ethical issues. Here's the thing, folks. Gap, by being so rules-based, it's allowed opportunities for people to be ones that gain the system. And another example of this, and this has been changed since, is accounting for leases. As we lease cars, companies can lease equipment. Well, as a student of financial accounting, I learned that there were four rules that had to be followed in order to record the lease as an asset or an expense. 
Well, the lease agreements or the contracts were purposely written in ways so that companies could get around the gap rules and record the lease as an expense. Because if the company recorded the lease as an asset, it had to record a liability. And companies wanted to keep the liabilities off the books because they wanted to make themselves look more liquid and more solvent, okay? So once again, with these rules. Now, what I wanna make a point here, I mentioned earlier, we, we looked at the slide about the gap in IFRS revenue recognition rules. What I'd like to read is this section of this book, The End of Accounting, written by Farouk Lev and Feng Gu. And this book, Another very interesting book, if you really want to get into the, the weaknesses of accounting and to learn on how we can better the process. In this book, there's a chapter called, so what to do with accounting, a reform agenda. And one of the things that Baruch Lev wrote about is dealing with the complexity that exists within accounting. And the section here, why accounting complexity? And I'm just gonna read this. Accounting is complex because business is complex is the standard answer to the above question. But this is a faulty project. Consider a company's sales. When should a sale be recorded as such in the books? It is hard to believe, but this question led to a 15-year project by the FASB, the Revenue Recognition Project, and despite having been presumably concluded in 2014 with the production of a 700-page rule book, it was soon delayed for another year because it's apparently not yet ready for prime time. Why the complexity? Primarily because regulators strive to incorporate in the rules any known or conceivable transaction and agreement between parties, even remote and inconsequential. The irony is that this is a futile endeavor. What I'd like you to get from this passage, and as it connects to discussing a question of ethics as it relates to the violation of accounting rules, gap through the FASB can be its own worst enemy. And I say that by, because by trying to make things so complex in terms of having all these rules, it can invite violations of the rules, okay? I'm sure you've heard of the acronym KISS, keep it short and simple. That's one of the factors that has come into the conversions. IFRS considered it a bit more simple than GAP because it is more principle-based. It is considered that IFRS can, may serve as a way to deal with the ethical questions that exist in companies because it's not providing an incentive to game the system by all the rules that exist in GAP, okay? Does anyone have any questions on what I've discussed pertaining to this slide? Okay. The last thing I'd like to talk about is I'd like to set the stage for next week when we do transaction analysis that affects revenues and expenses, okay? Now you see in this illustration, the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. And underneath both assets and liabilities, we have T accounts. And we see under the T accounts, the left side of each T account contains the word debit. The right side of the T account contains the word credit. That applies to the definitions of a debit and credit. A debit 
means the left side, a credit means the right side. And as I mentioned last week, please, please, please do not confuse debits and credits with debit cards and credit cards. Because I have mentioned a student I had several years ago, I lost that student in the understanding. It's the equivalent of Anakin Skywalker going to the dark side and becoming Darth Vader. If you just keep it simple and just know that a debit means the left side, credit means the right side, it simplifies the recording of transactions based on, an, on our analysis. And you see within stockholders equity, we divide stockholders equity into two components. Contributed capital, which represents what the stockholders or the owners are giving to the business in the forms of common stock and additional paid in capital and earned capital, what the business is giving to the stockholders. We've talked about dividends, a distribution of retained earnings. Well, our focus is on the remaining elements comprising retained earnings. Revenues and expenses, okay? And as you can see, when we talked about revenues and expenses earlier, revenues increase retained earnings, therefore increase stockholders' equity. Expenses decrease retained earnings, therefore decrease stockholders' equity, okay? The last slide I want to talk about this tonight, as you can see, revenues increase net income and stockholders equity. Because net, pardon me, because revenues increase stockholders equity, we go back to our rules. Our rule states, if you increase stockholders equity, we credit. So when we record revenues, we're going to record credits with our journal entries, okay? So that means the normal balance for revenues will be a credit balance. Expenses, as you can see, decrease stockholders' equity. Because expenses decrease stockholders' equity, we go back to our rule. If you decrease stockholders' equity, you debit. And because expenses have normal debit balances, we, we, we have the expenses appearing as debits on a trial balance, okay? So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to conduct transaction analysis for operating activities, activities that we're going to begin recording on the income statement as revenues and expenses, okay? Does anyone have any questions about the illustration in this slide? Okay, before we proceed to our process of closing tonight's class, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about accrual basis accounting. And I want to talk to you for, about a company that I became aware of, okay? This company was a startup. And this company began with a small group of employees. And the group comprised four individuals, okay? Now, these individuals were deemed employees, but these individuals deemed employees were going to be compensated with salary, okay? But here was the thing with the startup. The startup could not generate enough cash to pay the employees for the work, okay? So the employees would work, but they wouldn't get paid. And that was due to an agreement that was made by the founder of the startup 
and the employees. Once the company earned sufficient revenues, the employees would be paid. When you use cash basis accounting under a situation like that, you are hiding liabilities, okay? You are hiding liabilities because you're not recognizing the expense until the employees get paid. But here's the thing, the employees are working. Because the employees are working, an expense has to be recorded. We have to record the expense and we have to record the liability. The obligation to pay the employees for its work, okay? I mentioned this example because what accrual basis accounting does is it brings out liquidity and solvency problems. It can also bring out a profitability problem because we're gonna record the expense when it takes place. But it really puts the emphasis on liquidity and solvency because by using accrual basis accounting, we record the liabilities and it can indicate any good or bad news related to liquidity and solvency. When we get back to what I talked about last week regarding the current ratio, I indicated that current ratio problems can be connected from liabilities to assets, most notably receivables and inventory. Current ratio problems can exist because receivables are not being collected timely and inventory is not being sold. Accrual basis accounting can bring out liquidity and solvency problems by indicating a disconnection between a company and its customers. Because by using accrual basis accounting, if the effort that is going into the creation, distribution, promotion, and support of what company sells does not resonate with customers, and the ultimate in resonation is the payment of cash. When, company, when people, when we're willing to pay money for something, we recognize the importance of the, of the company. If companies are exerting effort that people say, well, we don't think it's worth us paying the money for this stuff, that can bring out a liquidity and solvency problem and those problems are better presented by using accrual basis accounting instead of cash basis accounting, okay? That is, those represent reasons why we use accrual basis accounting, okay? So once again, what I wanted to get into this week is how our language is going to be more precise. The precision is labeled accrual basis accounting. We're going to recognize and ultimately record revenues when earned and expenses when paid. The, re the recognition of revenues and expenses is not based on or dictated by the receipt in payment of cash, okay? Does anybody have any questions on that particular, the, the explanation that I just made? Does anybody have any questions on what I presented this evening? Okay. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to talk about next week okay next week next week's class i am going to do the second part of 
my presentation of chapter three, okay? This is the last chapter in which the presentation is going to be over two weeks. After we finish chapter three, the presentations are going to be one week. I wanted to do two week presentations of chapters two and three because they represent the building of a foundation necessary to develop financial literacy. And when I talk about financial literacy, I'm talking about the reading and writing of financial statements. Our ability to read and write financial statements develops a financial literacy that we can connect to other courses here in the Providence College MBA program, whether we're dealing with economics, finance, marketing, and connecting what we're doing in the classroom to the, to the job. And to the job, I'm talking about functions like marketing, like human resources, like legal, okay? So next week, I'm going to conclude or do part two of my presentation of chapter three, okay? Also, next week, the second assignment of the semester is going to be active. That is quiz two. Quiz two is based on material that I presented this evening, okay? It is gonna be based on three exercises that I selected from chapter three, okay? Now, once again, the quiz is an open book assignment. You have access to the ebook that's in Connect. You can use your notes, in addition to the textbook, you can also use the slides that I used tonight that are in Sakai. Whatever is most comfortable for you to work the process of understanding the question and, and, answer, and finding the answer, okay? Understanding the question and finding the answer. Now, this assignment like all other assignments for this semester, will be in Connect. The quiz two will become active at 12 a.m. this Sunday, September 20, blah, 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 third, September 25th, and will become inactive at the end of the day Saturday, October 2nd at 11.59 p.m. So basically, you have seven full days to complete this assignment, all right? Does anyone have any questions about that? Now, there are just two other things that I'd like to just mention, and it's kind of sort of feedback on the protocol for the assignments, the quizzes and the exams. What I don't want to do is I don't want to address questions relating to the quizzes because when, when they're active, because I don't want to, I don't want to do anything until I get a sufficient amount of data. And I consider a sufficient amount of data when everybody has submitted their answers, okay? So I don't want to get into a discussion where I say one thing, but I turn out doing another. My preference is I rather wait and discuss the matter after the assignment is closed so I have enough data to evaluate the situation, okay? That's the first thing that I wanna mention. Now, another thing that I want to mention is if students ask questions about content on the quizzes, I make every effort not to answer it. It's not because I want to be rude. It's because I have one big problem. 
you might be thinking, oh my goodness, that's all just one big problem. When it comes to students asking me questions about contents on an assignment, I got a terrible habit of giving the answer. I don't know, maybe because that's a, I'm a sweetheart, but I just have a terrible habit of giving people answers. So if my, if I may say, I can't answer the question because it addresses content and I will end up giving the answer or may give the answer, or I'm just saying, please follow the instructions that are in the quiz. It's not that I'm being rude. I am really trying to avoid giving you the answer because I don't think you're going to learn by me giving you the answers. And remember, it's a process of understanding the question and finding the answer. The answer's there. You just have to find it. And it gets back to that big picture of solving problems, okay? So if I'm not quick to respond or rather cloudy in my responses, number one, I wanna make sure that I get enough data before I can get my arms wrapped around the situation because I assure you, I have what's called the George Costanza, it's not you, it's me routine. And what I mean by that, if, stu if I see something in an assignment where there is commonality in, in, this, in the quiz, where it's something I did wrong, I will make the adjustment, okay? Always remember, your focus is on learning, my focus is on grading. So if I see something that doesn't look right and it doesn't look right because I did something wrong, I will adjust accordingly, okay? I have built in the grading system flexibility for allowing me to make these changes. So don't worry about your grading. Your focus is on learning. My focus is on grading. And remember, my friends, who I like to talk quite often, one of her favorite quotes, first learn, then remove L. You work the process, the earning of the grade is good. And I will tell you that the roster average for quiz one was in the neighborhood of 96%. I think that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. So my compliments to all of you, okay? So once again, next week, if it's something that you raise, if I'm not being specific or being precise, it's because I'm purposely avoiding giving students the answer, but I will look at the quiz. And if something looks odd to me, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about that. I don't want to do anything that's going to hinder your effort in learning the course material, okay? Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Next week, I will send an, a group email representing a reminder of next week. Next week, we'll be getting into week five, believe it or not, after next set, Thursday, we will have finished one third of the semester. And my reminder, will indicate that I will resume or pick up the second part of my lecture of chapter three by beginning with slide number 32 of the slide deck. And I will also post, a, also include a reminder about quiz two, okay? Does anybody have any questions about my plan for next week? Okay. Folks, I have concluded 